Got it. Good evening, everybody. This is the call, the Wilmette Board of Trustees meeting for October 19th at 6.31 p.m. All the notices have been given and the materials made available online. May we please call to order the meeting and have a roll call. Director Austin? Certainly. Trustee Fishman? Here. Trustee Nealon? Here. Trustee O'Keefe? Here. Trustee Riddle? Present. Trustee Summer? Here. And Trustee McDonald? Here. Okay. Trustee and Wolf is here too. Oh, and Trustee you, you Wolf. Left me off the, you have left me off the motion sheet, but thank you, yeah. Thank you, Stuart. <laughs> sure. Getting used to, yeah. Okay, and so who do we have as guests? Uh, Laura. Okay, and Laura, are you representing any particular group or just yourself? No, no just myself. Okay, thank you, Laura. And you have several, uh, you have Mary Lawler and Elizabeth Seeger. Are they, there's some other people too. Yep, and we've got a few staff members on the call as well. Okay. I see Kim Haglin, Patsy Devono, um, Marty Belfontaine, John Risco, and Gail Justman. Okay, at this time, if you're not speaking, I would ask everybody to just put their silence, uh, turn your mics off. Thank you. Okay. So at this time, do we have any comments from the public? Um, I do have a comment. Okay. Um, so my name is Mary Lawler and I'm speaking individually and not on behalf of any organization. Um, I'm here to talk about the tax levy. Um, first, I did wanna to touch on the modeling from the October 5th meeting because I didn't think there was correct understanding of that modeling. Um, that presentation from what I could tell did not model a flat tax levy for this year. It modeled an increase of 1.4% plus an amount for new property. Levy year 2022 was projected to be flat, but you aren't deciding on that until next year. All years after 20, levy year 2022 in the model, I think projected tax increases to the tax cap based on an assumed CPI of 1.5% 1, 1 and assumed new property each year of 15 million. Um, that model also showed a $3.75 million transfer from the general fund to the special reserve fund in this fiscal year. And the last page of the model, which there was some discussion on, um, I think was a sensitivity analysis showing the effects on the model of actual CPI and new property being different than what was assumed. Um, so now that that's, <laughs> now we'll go on to um, the modeling I think you should do before you decide on your tax levy for this year, and also whether to, to make the transfer from the general fund to the special reserve fund. Um, I suggest you do various models for a flat tax levy for some potential decreases and for a potential increase to the tax cap. In all cases, model both with and without a transfer to the special reserve fund. In all models, pay attention to the assumptions for future years and the implications of those assumptions and the sensitivity analysis with respect to those assumptions. Be sure you understand each model, all of it. You should understand where every number in the model comes from. Um, third, some things to keep in mind. Really think about whether you wanna do that big transfer to the special reserve fund. Um, your policy doesn't seem to require it, but it does require you to take into account your capital needs for the upcoming fiscal year and your special reserve fund is pretty well funded. Once you transfer those funds, you are limited in how you can use them. Um, I agree you want to avoid an operating tax refund, but I would like you to show your work. Why would a flat tax avoid a referendum and why would any decrease put you at risk, especially given the three-year rule and also the possibility of not making a big transfer to the special reserve fund. Um, you really don't want to go to referendum with a large special reserve fund. People will think that's a self-inflicted wound. Um, last thing, um, 
I, I, I'm wondering about a property tax abatement. I have no idea what the possibilities are for doing that, but I'd be interested in hearing if that's a possibility. Um, I wanna make it clear, I am not pushing for any particular tax levy for this year. I'm not pushing for an increase, a decrease, or the same. I have no idea. But what I would like is for you having a rationale for your tax levy and understanding what that rationale is. I think this is your most difficult task. It's really tricky, um, especially with a you know a ta an entity subject to PTEL. Um, but it's important. Thank you for your service and good luck. Thank you, Ms. Lawler, for your astute analysis. Are there any other comments or presentations from the public at this time? Hearing none, it's a good time to transition to uh, review the minutes. You've got the review of the minutes from September 21st, 2021. They were sent out probably two weeks after the meeting and also uh, with any comments that you all had were sent out on Friday. Are there any comments or questions regarding the minutes now? Hearing none, is it possible to have a motion? I move approval of the minutes approval. of the regular meeting of September 21st, 2021 as presented. Okay. Uh, Trustee Wolf has moved approval. Is there a second? Trustee Fishman will second. Trustee Fishman has seconded. Being that the discussion has been, uh, opportunity for discussion has passed, can we just have a roll call for approval of the minutes? Director Austin? Certainly. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Nealon? Yes. Thank you. Trustee O'Keefe. Yes. Trustee Riddle. Yes. Trustee Summer. Yes. Trustee Wolf. Yes. And Trustee McDonald. Yes. Thank you. And at this time, Director Austin, would you like to introduce Brad Porter? This is the first time we've just switched accounting firms, which is good practice at about every seven years. And would you like to make that transition? Thank you. Most certainly. I, I, it's my pleasure this evening to introduce Brad Porter. He's a partner at Lauterbach and Amen LLP, our new auditing firm. And he's here this evening to present the independent auditor's report and provide an overview of fiscal year 2020-21 and the annual financial report that we've shared with you all, its findings, and to address any questions that you may have. So at this time, I'm going to turn the floor over to Brad. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Brad Porter. I'm uh, one of our audit managers at Lauterbach and Amen, uh, and I'll be giving you a brief recap of the fiscal year 2021 uh, audit cycle. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to remote in here this evening. I really appreciate it. Um, and with this being the first year with our firm, uh, I can certainly say that we could not have been happier with how the process has gone overall. Um, I'd like to personally thank John, Anthony, and the finance team for all of their efforts, uh, not just come audit prep time. Really, I think an audit is a culmination of really the entire fiscal year. So uh, we had a number of great productive conversations prior to field work that kind of allowed for a very seamless audit transition. So um, as with any new auditing firm, we certainly do pose our own uniquenesses as it relates to different recommendations, uh, the format of the report, and some of those things. So uh, I really do value some of those conversations that we've had over the last couple of weeks, uh, especially. Um, and before I do begin my coverage of the audit material, I did just want to mention that over the course of the last few days, and even up until 10 minutes before this meeting started, uh, we've had a number of conversations just on some minor tweaks and revisions that we will be making following this meeting. So um, you will be receiving, hopefully, the audit uh, here this evening, and we'll be making those tweaks uh, subsequent to the meeting. So uh, we look forward to issuing the final, final reports, and uh, we appreciate your patience throughout the process. With that said, there are three pieces of uh, required communication that we issue during our audit process. And I'm gonna start with the three page letter that we call our SAS 114 letter. Um, in accordance with statement on auditing standard number 114, we are required to disclose whether or not we had any disagreements or difficulties that we had encountered throughout our audit process. And I'm very happy to report that in the body of that letter, you will find no such disagreements or difficulties noted. 
Uh, moving on, we'll jump it right into the annual financial report. Um, and that is the thicker of the two bound documents. Uh, if you have it in PDF format, I'll be referencing certain page numbers throughout the audit as I go. So um, we will start with page one and two. And I'll give everybody a chance to scroll or turn to pages one and two. You'll find our uh, letterhead there, a lot of name and letterhead. On pages one and two, you're going to find our uh, the portion of your audit titled the Independent Auditor's Report. I like to look at this as the most important page of the audit, and that's not just because it has auditors in the name, I promise. Um, ultimately, the Independent Auditor's Report states what your responsibility is as management, and that is to make sure that we as your auditors are provided uh, a clean set of financial statements to work with. We then go on in the middle of page one to state what our responsibility is as your audit firm, and that is to generate an opinion on the financial statements that were provided to us. So I'm happy to report uh, we will be issuing, and you can see it here in the paragraph, in the opinions paragraph, uh, what we call an unqualified audit opinion for fiscal year 2021, uh, which is ultimately the cleanest form of opinion that any entity in the governmental accounting world can receive. An unqualified opinion essentially states, and you can see there in the verbiage, that we believe the financial statements are free from any material misstatement, and that there are sound internal controls in place throughout the number of internal control walkthroughs that we do uh, as part of our audit process. So kudos to everybody involved in the process. Um, it's certainly an accomplishment. Turning to page four, I would like to highlight a section that we call the management's discussion and analysis. And we are the first to understand as your audit firm that sometimes the financial statements themselves can be quite difficult to understand and interpret. Um, so I would absolutely encourage you to spend a lot of time and energy in this MDNA section. Um, it's going to really provide a great narrative analysis of the financial highlights for fiscal year 2021. Um, it will have a number of comparative charts and graphs, uh, so a lot of very useful information in this section, and it really allows you to kind of have a, a bird's eye view of the fiscal year, so um, certainly wanted to point out this section to you as a board. I'd like to scroll to page 16. Give me a moment to do so. On page 16, you're going to find our statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. And that is a fancy governmental accounting term for our income statement for the fiscal year. Um, here you'll see your general and special reserve funds itemized in different columns and one uh, cumulative non-major fund total, which is going to include uh, some of your other small special levies that can be found in the back of the report. So I'd like to highlight uh, on page 16, the third line up from the bottom there is what we call our net change in fund balance. Does everybody see that? That is essentially our net operating income or operating loss for the fiscal year. So um, for fiscal year 2021, the general fund had a operating loss on paper of about $80,486. Whereas the special reserve fund had a operating loss of about $449,000. And I think I use the term loss a little bit loosely there because you can see uh, you certainly had quite a big year in terms of capital outlay expenses for fiscal year 2021. Um, the next line up from that $449,000 figure, you can see you had over $500,000 of capital outlay charges in the fiscal year. So uh, certainly coordinated, uh, budgeted for, et cetera. There's this, I, I use that term very loosely. I'd like to scroll to page 18 now, where you'll find our notes to the financial statements. I think it's important, especially in a first year audit, uh, each firm titles their notes a little bit differently. Some firms have more notes than others. So I wanted to walk through kind of our basis of what each of these footnotes looks like and what can be found uh, within each of them. So uh, on page one, uh, 18, you'll find note one, which is going to be titled our summary of significant accounting policies. Um, that is exactly what this is. It's going to explain a lot of the hows, what's, and why's of governmental accounting. Note two begins on page 21. This is our stewardship compliance and accountability footnote, which simply explains what the library's budget process is. Note three begins on page 22. 
that's titled our detailed notes on all funds, where you're going to find a lot of useful information pertaining to your investment balances, capital asset balances, uh, operating leases, etc. And note four begins on page 25 at the bottom there. Um, and this is called our other information. And it's pretty much an all encompassing footnote for anything that falls outside the scope of those first three notes. So um, you'll find a lot of very informational or informal information pertaining to your IMRF pension plan and some of those matters. I'd like to jump over to the management letter. That is the additional bound document that was provided. Um, I'll give you a chance to open that up. Really the primary purpose of any management letter is to convey any internal control recommendations that we have, um, any best practices that we see in the industry, or any upcoming GASB pronouncements. Uh, as you can imagine, we do audit a number of libraries and I'm actually the manager that kind of oversees our entire library client base. So, um, you know, we take a lot of, uh, you know, this management letter is very, very important. It allows us to kind of convey some of the uniquenesses that set our firm apart and some of the value that we can provide uh, to the library. And so I'd like to highlight that we had three current recommendations for fiscal year 2021. The first current recommendation would be uh, the need for an outstanding check policy, uh, which is really going to um, state what the appropriate procedures are to ensure that the library is in compliance uh, with the state's unclaimed property act. Um, really, after one year, you should be writing off your outstanding checks from your bank reconciliation and moving them into an unclaimed property liability account. After three years, those checks should be turned over to the state's unclaimed property division. So um, I'm happy to report we have actually taken action on this policy, as well as the capital asset policy, which will be mentioned shortly. Um, Anthony and John and I had a great conversation about um, the implementation of these policies, and we have subsequently provided samples. So, um, you know, it, it says a lot about the, the library's willingness to already, uh, you know, seek action on a number of these recommendations. The second comment is in regards to GASB 87, uh, which is going to be the accounting for leases. This is going to change the way that leases are going to be reported in fiscal year 2022 and forward. Um, you as a board, there's absolutely nothing that you need to be concerned with or worry about as it relates to GASB 87. We'll be working kind of hand in hand with the finance team on evaluating all potential leases uh, of the library and what that means from an accounting standpoint. And lastly, uh, we have capital asset policy. Um, we have provided a, a template for our capital asset policy already as well. Um, it's very important that the library does develop a capital asset policy that states um, what your capitalization procedures are, estimated useful lives, as well as uh, what your capitalization thresholds are for each of the categories that are mentioned uh, in note three of your audit. On the same topic, I did actually want to jump back into the audit report on page 25. Sorry, making you switch gears a little bit, but got to keep you on your toes. On page 25, uh, you're going to find a paragraph titled net position restatement. And this is one of those things that, uh, again, was more of a firm philosophy approach. Um, Historically, the library has had over 20 years of compiled library books that have been rolled forward in your capital asset schedule. Um, we know as your audit firm that realistically, a lot of those books have likely been disposed of or were depleted, meaning that they had a net book value of zero after the accumulation uh, accumulated depreciation ultimately nets out with the asset. So what we did was we actually said, in accordance with this future policy, um, where we recommend a seven-year useful life for books. We're going to remove all assets and accumulate depreciation to date on assets that were included in your capital asset detail beyond that seven-year threshold. So the net figure that ultimately decreased your overall net position was of only $34,000 uh, when all of that was said and done, despite us removing over $3 million of cost and accumulated depreciation. So I did just wanna highlight that 
Um, I think it, it follows the flow of the, you know, implementation of this policy for fiscal year 2022. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I think I'd be happy to answer any questions on that topic specifically, um, or any other questions that you have. Sure. I saw a hand. I have, <laughs> I have questions. Sure. This no may problem. be the one that you've indicated. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, I sure can. This may be the one you got notice of 10 minutes ago. <laughs> um, if you look on page 39 of the audit report, um, the insurance number does not tie to what I thought it should be. Um, I think that uh, insurance should include the employee health insurance, and that should be it. It should not include FICA and yep. include, I don't know what else was in there. I, couldn't, I actually couldn't figure out what was included in that number. Yes, this was the topic that Anthony and I had discussed 10 minutes before the meeting. So we will be moving that uh, to the respective FICA insurance fund um, okay. to ensure, that, yep. What else was included in that? And you and you ensure you also need to make sure that the budgeted amount is the correct one, not the pro appropriations amount. Yes. Because the number correct. that was in there was the appropriations, not the budget amount. Yep. Yes, we will be updating both of those. Um, I think we had a, a nice call before this indicating ultimately in the prior year audit, it was a little bit misleading because the titles of each of these respective columns was original and final appropriation. Ah. If you look if you look back at your prior year's audit, which would led us to believe that that should be your original and final appropriation for those funds that you had not established a working budget for. So um, we're definitely on the same page. And like I said, we look forward to correcting this following uh, the meeting here tonight. Okay, so then are you gonna also move, um, put back over insurance property and casualty in the correct column? Yes, yep. Oh, okay. Um, let's see, okay. So that number will be only employees health insurance budget, which will be 600,000. Actual will be 600 and some thousand. So it will actually look a little bit more in line with our historical data. It won't be so skewed. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, I got my miscellaneous expense question answered. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was, all my other comments were corrected. The incorrect fund balance was corrected. Um, I think the, did you guys fix, I think you fixed the wrong um, municipality that was correct. Yes. Yep. Okay. yep. Oh, does I anyone think, else? Uh, as with any first year audit process, we've got our cookie cutter templates and oftentimes that that can be missed. So I apologize for that. You want to explain the miscellaneous? Well, I could, yeah. Tracy? Uh, I can tell you what it is because I just asked. Miscellaneous is the purchase of the library vehicle and it is uh, part of an endowment. So it technically um, it, it is included in the actual expenses, but it really wasn't a general fund uh, expense. Am I stating that correctly? And it, it, it's, yeah. So it really wasn't a technically a budgeted item because it really didn't come out of our general fund budget. Yep. And thank you for answering all my questions. I was bombarding Anthony and John regularly with them. Of course, yeah. I think in terms of the timing, obviously it wasn't ideal. I do apologize for that, but um, mm -hmm. glad we were able to get these figured out and you know, we'll make sure that the corrected version is filed with the comptroller and all the necessary agencies. So we do okay. take care of the comptroller filing for the library. Okay, we will get a copy of this though before you do that. Can I, because I'll give it another once over before we- Of course, we... yes, okay. absolutely. Okay. What? Why was the reinstatement only 34,000 when you, it seemed like the, based on your conversation that we had not been doing it? Uh, so the restatement was 34,000 because that was essentially the undepreciated portion of your existing library materials. So you had years and years of books that continued to get added to the detail with no subsequent disposals. So at that point, they kind of reached their, the end of their useful lives. So the 34,000 is kind of that small increment of remaining book value that was left on the books uh, as a result of that restatement. So there was no overstatement? 
No, no, no no overstatement per se. I I think, like I said, this is more of a change in accounting principle uh, type of matter. And, you know, it it will follow the useful life that we had recommended in the policy of seven years for library materials. Okay. And I've got a a comment regarding the outstanding check write-off policy. While we didn't have a policy, there was a procedure in place. So we will be looking at all these policies the second week in December when the policy committee will be meeting and Anthony will be getting us the revised policies and we'll be looking at the revised financial policy and a new operational policy that's been in process. So this will occur. And then the other question I've got is, the only leases we really have are copiers. Are there other lease items we have? Nope, this is included in every single audit and management letter that we issue. So this isn't meant to be any type of, you know, Mm -hmm. ding by management, anything along those lines. We simply include a comment for every single upcoming GASB pronouncement that could potentially have an impact. And I will tell you right from the get-go, the copier leases kind of fall outside the scope of GASB 87 because of the immateriality of those transactions. Um, you're paying a couple hundred bucks on a monthly basis and cumulatively it does not hit our materiality threshold. So um, we actually can kind of uh, pass on implementing GASB 87 for copiers. Okay. Are there other questions? Tracy? And then Fina. Um, I I did actually, I meant to ask this earlier. About how much were an unclaimed checks? What was the one year and three year uh, I would have to pull up the bank reconciliations. I don't have that readily and available, but I'd be happy to to follow up with an email. Yeah, I'm trying to get the idea of the materiality of it. Sure. Yeah, it, it probably is not much, but I think the the concept behind this comment is more so having a documented policy in place uh, to refer back to. So, yeah, if you can just get back to me, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Brad, um, I thank you so much for, for your report. I was wondering um, a little bit more about the peer analysis that you your firm may do and um, whether that would be you know, included more as we go forward. Um, you know, in particular, I think it, it would be nice to know, I think it's, um, it was, it's been an extraordinary year obviously, because um, we work, there was a closing period for our library. I'm sure other libraries experienced that as well. Um, You know, we, there was a comment on page 12 that we experienced a substantial savings realized versus um, budgetary expenses in the areas of culture and recreation and operations. And I'm sure that was, I'm sure that was similar across other, other, uh, other libraries. Um, would you say, would you say that's true? Yes, I think all in all, I think most of the clients, I can't say all that I work with have done a really great job of saying we have a very tough time ahead. And this was obviously at the onset of COVID. And I was really impressed with a lot of entities and their ability to make the cuts that nobody wanted to do and to make some of those difficult decisions. So I think all in all, you know, nothing stood out as abnormal to us throughout this process. Um, I hope that kind of answers your question. It's very difficult, you know, to, to compare apples to oranges. I know every library's operations are different and revenue sources differ a little bit. So um, as much as I wish I had a, a good comparative analysis for you to work off of, it's, it's quite difficult. And I was wondering, with the cash basis accounting methods, are you able to provide more opinions? Um, you know, on the opinion page, unqualified, of course, I understand that that's a clean bill of health. Um, but there was, for example, a comment that, you know, the increases or decreases in the net position may serve as a useful ind- indicator of whether the financial position of the library district is in proving or deteriorating. And so it would be nice to know there, you know, are you able to provide more of a... a... Really the only spot where narrative analysis comes into play is the management discussion and analysis. And we do kind of give the library the chance to update the verbiage throughout this section. So I think looking out, if we would like to add a little bit more detail. I think that's certainly a discussion that you can kind of have internally. 
the MDNA is kind of the, you know, the, the world's your oyster in a sense where you have the ability to add any type of explanatory verbiage updates that you see fit. Um, we do do a brief review to make sure that the numbers are in line with our financial statements and some of those things, but uh, really you have free reign in terms of the MDNA section. Thank you, Brad. Yeah, no problem. That's all I have. Any other questions? Fred, I've, I've just got a question. Based on your experience, generally, how do uh, some of your library clients handle transfer of funds to capital in terms of how, the procedure and the process? Uh, it's certainly, you know, intended to follow what your long-term capital planning initiatives are. So. Um, I think it's important to note, obviously, once you transfer money into special reserves, it can't come back out. It's restricted at that point. So um, I think a lot of very difficult conversations need to be had as it relates to what is kind of our upfront funding source going to look like. And um, so there's definitely a lot of high level conversations that that should be had. But um, ultimately, the library will make a determination on, you know, based on our upcoming capital needs for one year, five years, depending on what your, uh, what that looks like. I think uh, that's kind of the extent of it. Do you all do any projections of CPI or inflation? Because I'm curious about that in terms of our modeling, because I think we were very conservative in what we put in there as to what. Uh, we personally, our firm does not, um, but I know we do work with a number of uh, different financial advisors that do such calculations. And you know, if that's something that you're interested in, we're happy to provide our recommendations. And we have someone doing it. We, I was just concerned, curious about what you saw it as. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? Excellent. Well, I really appreciate your time here this evening and your patience kind of throughout this whole process. Uh, once you get the first year behind you, things start to streamline and become a little bit more efficient. So, Tracy. Can I ask one more question? I'm sorry. Um, I, I was curious as to why this financial statement didn't, I just, this just occurred to me, didn't say draft on it. Does it doesn't say, does it say draft across it? No, it does not. Um, but ultimately, as long as it's not submitted to the respective agencies, we can we're going to planning to redate the report and go through that the, that okay. process. Yep. Can I make a recommendation that you guys do put draft across it just because I think that for the public to pull it, I think it gives the impression that it is the final copy. And then when we do these updated versions, I think it, yep. it would be helpful for everybody to know we're still in the draft and it's not the submitted one. Yes, yes, it is important to note that. And I know, you know, Anthony and I discussed that prior to the meeting as the, the library is receiving the audit tonight. This is not being formally approved in this uh, mm -hmm. capacity, so. Okay, thank you. No problem. John or Anthony, do you all have any closing comments regarding the financial report? I mean, I guess I will say thank you, Brad. It's been a pleasure working with you and your firm. And um, we're, we're looking forward to addressing the topics that we discussed here this evening in an effort to get um, the final documentation to you all and get that, that version posted on our website for everyone's consumption. So thank you, Brad. It's great having you aboard. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Stay safe. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye -bye. At this time, um, Turn it over to our treasures report, Trustee Summer. Thank you, Trustee McDonald. Um, everyone received the notes, the financial report and all the docu supporting documentation. Uh, as you can see, the real estate taxes, the revenues beginning to be received. Um, the, John wrote a nice note that the general fund expenditures are running below the expected three month rate. But as we have noted in previous months, this can fluctuate due to the timing of payments and number of payrolls per month. So just because we are operating at a little bit less doesn't necessarily mean next month we won't be operating a little bit above. Um, just kind of things to note, there were significant expenditures from the Special Reserve Fund for paving, Shales McNutt and Enberg, all relating to the continuing renovations. And um, I looked at all the checks and disbursements uh, just one item to note that there were approximately $35,000 in checks written to ProQuest during the last month. 
and they are providers of many of the library's premium subscriptions and research data, such as New York Times, Ancestry Library, historical newspapers, that kind of thing. Um, does anybody have any questions on any of the financial reports or the check details? Anyone? Okay. Um, I move for approval of the bills and salaries check detail for August 2021. I'll second that. Very good. It's been moved by Trustee Summer and seconded by Trustee Wolf to approve the bills and salary check, check detail for September 2021. Roll call. Okay. Um, Trustee Fishman. I see the yes, I don't hear the yes. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> there we go, there we go. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. Trustee Nealon. Yes. Trustee O'Keefe. Yes. Trustee Riddle. Yes. Trustee Summer. Yes. Trustee Wolf. Yes. And Trustee McDonald. Yes. Okay. Thank you. At this time, we have only one action item, and that's the approval of the holiday closings for calendar year 2022. There have been two additional um, holidays where WOMET will be open that are federal holidays, and that's Juneteenth and Indigenous Peoples Day. And what the library will do on those is use it as a day to educate schools out, but they will be using it as a day to educate basically our clients, I call them clients, but basically our customers, as well as the general public and schools out. And I think it's a good learning experience for them to do that. And so are there, is there any discussion regarding the holiday schedule? That's the only change from the past. Yes, yeah, Trustee Bina, I mean Riddle. My only comment was, you know, on the days before the holidays, I don't know if you'd consider earlier. I, I, do you have experience, Anthony, that people are, you know, like staying till five? Like, what about one or two p.m.? I or, thought three p.m. or three. Okay. Yeah. I, I thank you. Um, yeah, uh, Trustee O'Keefe had, had that question for me as well. Um, traditionally, in library land, um, the days before holidays can be busy. Um, families will come in and they will stock up on materials in advance of the holidays, anticipating that we are going to be closed. Um, so yes, we do abbreviate our hours on those days. Um, we're talking about the days before the Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays. Um, we're typically open till 9 p.m. on uh, those weekdays and we close at five on those days. I would say that that last hour that we're open between four and five can be one of the busiest hours of the day that day. And if we were to skew that a little bit earlier, um, I think that some of the folks who are uh, working on those days might not have an opportunity to come in and pick up their hold material. Um, so it, it varies. And I think it, certainly in a pandemic year, um, we've had some unusual um, door counts just because of a lot of circumstances. Um, but I do think that this pattern of us being open till 5 p.m. is um, fairly is consistent with what we're seeing in our neighboring agencies and I think what the public has come to expect from us. So I think abbreviating the day a little bit more um, is something we could evaluate and I can give you some more um, door count data in next year when we go through this process and, and share with you what our experience was this year, if that's a, a topic that you'd like to address again at that time. I would recommend that, you know, if we were to go that route that we, we maybe not take that approach until we've got a little bit more data to substantiate it here. So let's study it this holiday season, and then we can determine where we wanna take that in 2023, if that's okay with you all. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's a great suggestion. Any other comments or thoughts? At this time, I move approval of the proposed holiday closings for calendar year 2022 as presented. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, so Trustee Wolf has seconded. Lisa McDonald, Trustee McDonald has moved. <laughs> Can we have a roll call? Certainly. Uh, Trustee Fishman. Yes. Trustee Nealon. Yes. Uh, Trustee O'Keefe. Yes. Trustee Riddle. Yes. Trustee Summer. Yes. 
and Trustee Wolf. Yes. And Trustee McDonald. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. At this, at this time, uh, Director, we're going to do discussion items and we'll turn it over to talk about a summary of the Finance Committee's meeting on October 5th, where we talk to draft, talk, discuss the ordinance regarding levying taxes for library purposes that uh, Ms. Lawler spoke about earlier in, in terms of her reflections on there. So Trustee Summer um, and Director Austin. And you can so, look at it, attachment five. Yep, so I'm gonna start with just a little introduction and then turn it over to Director Austin. Being my first year uh, on the board, I learned a lot. And so I will give what I know and then I'll let Anthony follow up with any follow-up information. So as uh, Lisa, our trustee McDonald indicated, there was a finance committee meeting on October 5th, and it was attended by all of the trustees, not just the, fi trust the finance committee. We discussed the draft of the ordinance number 2021, 22-202, um, an ordinance for levying taxes for, per for library purposes for the fiscal year 2021-2022 for a total of $5,428,251. Um, we had an, some assistance from the financial consultant whose initial assum assumption was to increase the levy by CPI year after year. Um, I will address one of uh, Mary Lawler's points, which was that one of the scenarios that he gave us was incorrect with a increase in the current year and a flat in the second year. So he did provide us with an update with a flat in the current year and then considering uh, increasing the levy by CPI going forward. So we did get an updated with that, Mary. Um, he also provided uh, us with more information with different scenarios with impact on the various funds, the uh, general fund reserve and the special reserve fund, including keeping the levy flat and decreasing. Um, and just as a side comment, I attended recently attended an uh, Illinois uh, Library Association conference where they assumed all libraries would always capture an increase in CPI. I think this is done by pretty much all libraries. Um, the presentation assumed that inflation alone would be the key, would require the levy to increase at least by CPI to prevent longer term funding problems and in meeting basic budget increases each year. It's we are very unusual in the fact we've either decreased or kept the levy flat for a number of years. Um, the proposed levy that we have put, the one that I mentioned earlier, reflects the same total as the year 2018-2019, 2019-2020, 2020, and 2020-21, um, with no levy, no increase in the levies. Uh, the deadline for filing the ordinance for the county clerk is the last Tuesday of December. I believe that was all I was going to say, and I was going to turn it over to Director Austin. Okay, well, that's a, that's a great succinct summary of our conversation from the fifth. Um, I can provide a little bit more information to you all as well. Um, so it is true that we've, um, we have gathered um, some other modeling information and I've shared that information with the board here in advance of our meeting this evening. There were some additional exhibits and a narrative background document that I shared with the trustees. Um, providing an overview of the levy process, as well as an FAQ to help clarify what some of the finer points of the language are that are included in the levy process. Um, so as we, as requested and as discussed um, at our meeting on the 5th, um, we did go back to um, our financial consultant that presented at our June, July meeting um, regarding our long range projections um, for the library district. Um, his initial presentation, as he stated to us, was with the assumption that we would capture CPI in our levy year over year. And um, so we had discussed that, but I believe this board, even at that time, was under the impression that we didn't necessarily want to raise our levy this year, recognizing um, a number of circumstances with our current funding uh, strategy that we didn't think that it was necessary for us to do a levy again, and therefore we asked him to, um, uh, or an increase to the levy, and therefore asked him to provide us with a model that showed a flat levy for this year. Um, so that was a, that's a document that um, we did update and correct and, and shared with everyone here over the weekend. Um, so as we demonstrated in the exhibits on the 10 uh, the 10 five meeting, by holding the levy flat for a third year in a row and not capturing CPI in this year, um, as was originally modeled, our general fund balance would drop below 
50% of our operating revenue by year 2032. Um, you may recall from the first presentation that Andrew did at our July 20th meeting, um, if, assuming that we captured CPI annually, we wouldn't see the general fund drop below 50% until fiscal year 2036. So um, a, a change by keeping it flat would escalate um, the drop of, of our general fund balance um, by four years from 2036 to 2032. So it stands to reason that if we were to reduce the levy in this fiscal year, um, that we would, we would also see a further reduction of that. And that was true when we, when we saw that modeling. So Andrew gave us a model where we reduced the levy by 1%. And by comparison, um, the general fund balance would drop below 50% in year 2030. So that's obviously two years sooner than if we held it, held it flat. Um, so it is interesting to see that there are long range implications for the decisions that we are making with our, with our levy this year. Holding it flat certainly has an implication. Um, reducing it certainly would, would escalate um, fund balances, which goes to the point of discuss, discussion of this transfer that we've been um, batting about for a while. In March of this year, we approved a new financial management policy. And for the first time, we had a fund balance policy that was included in that process was a discussion that the board had been having over the course of many months leading up to the approval of that fund balance policy. And the fund balance policy states that we wanna keep one year of our general operating fund um, in, in our general fund in the event that, that we have a cause to use that and to not allow that fund to drop below 50%. So um, as it stands right now, um, we do have a healthy fund balance in our general fund. And we also have in hand a 20 year capital reserve study that shows that we need a certain balance in there um, to, to encumber all of the uh, projects that we have in mind over the course of the next 20 years. The largest project year of, of course, is the one that we're in right now where we have a project that totals about $1.8 million that we're nearly finished with. So it may be a strategy that this board might want to replace the monies that have been expended this year on our capital uh, plan um, or entertain some other strategy as far as our fund balance is concerned. Um, but I do think that that is certainly one of the topics and that was addressed in our public comment as well that we're going to need to have to consider that and the impact of our levy decisions as well on our overall fund balances. Um, I think these are the key elements that, that we need to discuss as a board. Um, we've seen the modeling, we've seen what the impacts can be. And um, I think this is an opportune moment for us to continue to have this discussion here. And if, if we need to, um, we can continue on with another finance committee subsequent um, to this meeting and in, in advance of the meeting um, in November, November 16th, when we are slated to approve our levy documents. So I think we should open the floor right now for further discussion on this. And there is supplemental information in your board packet showing our financial and tax levy data dating back to 2014. Um, you'll also note that in your audit materials that we also have 10 years uh, look back on the, uh, the levy information as well. Are there any questions or comments that you'd like to discuss? Fina? Yes, Fina. Thanks. I'm open to meeting once again, if we could. Um, I spoke with John a little bit this morning about the materials um, we received, um, the narrative overview and um, the two presentations. I would, I would really think, um, I would like to, all of us to discuss, to discuss the overview and in, 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 in how we are um, communicating and showing examples, I think of our, uh, calculations. Um, and um, specifically on, um, you know, how the, how we can, I think, explain the model that Kim, Mr. Kim provided, and also how we can um, show an example of, of the levy and its impact on our property tax, tax bill. So I would love to go through this overview. I would love to go through the the um, packets that Mr. Kim provided. And if we, if you are all open for a another finance committee meeting, I think that would be 
helpful before the November meeting. I also wanted to ask if we have another, um, I think we adopt this in November as well, if you would correct me if I'm wrong, it's called the Tentative Budget and Appropriation Ordin Ordinance. Um, I believe we adopt this as well in the November meeting. Would you mind letting me know if we do that or if we've already done this? The Budget and Appropriation Ordinance is completed in August. So we've already, we've already made that approval. Okay. I wasn't sure if we did that with the tax levy. Final, I know we did that. Um, okay, good to know. So during the November meeting, we will be um, approving the levy, the maximum allowable levy, and that will be set for our December meeting, I believe, correct? No, no I, I can answer that. What we will what we'll do is we'll talk about it, and if we want to have a finance committee meeting, we certainly can to, to come up with it, to be but we need to approve it in the November meeting. In the it's next the meeting, November we need to meeting. approve the levy okay. uh, because it's due the last Tuesday of December. I believe that's correct. Okay. And I'm date. sorry, that's what I that's okay. No, Thank okay. you. Um, Anthony, can I ask a question about when, at what point do we decide about the transfer? Do we decide that at the time that we approve the levy in November? Yeah, I mean, that's obviously a decision that could be made even in the finance committee. If you want to have that that conversation there or here, um, you know, we can certainly get into this conversation and talk a little bit more about the impacts of that. You can make any requests for background information or, or other modeling that you want to discuss with relation to that. Um, it's it's a decision that you can undertake at any point. I think the the, the key element that I wanted to make sure that you all had in hand was a copy of our final audited financials for last fiscal year so you could understand our financial position and compare it to the modeling that was completed for us so that you've got you know, the, the near-term picture as well as the long range and so that you can consider the impacts. But we can undertake that, that decision at any point. Um, we do have a policy. Um, it is up to you to decide how you want to um, comply with your policy. Um, so it's, it's entirely up to you how you want to do that. But I think that receiving the audit was the very first step that we needed to complete before you could undertake that decision. Um, may I ask a quick question because I don't have the policy in front of me. It is not a requirement, it is a recommendation. Isn't that correct? A recommendation that the library maintain six months to a year in the general fund reserve. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, Anybody else want but to? haven't, excuse me, but haven't we made our policy that it would be one year? The intent was a year. It was six to six months to a year, but I think the overall commit uh, board at that time, majority wanted a year because you don't want to just keep six months because so much can happen in terms of emergencies of loss and property taxes and a whole bunch of stuff. So I think yeah. it was a year was the ideal goal yeah, in terms of slowly call. dropping it down to a year. Tracy, just out of curiosity, at, at, the, um, at the event you just attended, did they speak to that at all? Six month reserve versus 12 month reserve? No, all they spoke about, it's a good question, uh, Stuart. They really only talked about um, the logistics and the nitty gritty on how the tax levy works and um, EAV and all the little details that go into it, but yeah, it's a good question. But Director um, Austin, when we looked at that policy, had done a survey of several libraries and they were all over the board. Yeah. And many had none when we considered that policy. You can get that information. You can share that information. Which was I believe the six months was at the end of the range, like not to go below six months. So preferably a year, but six months lowest. I, I'm going to, uh, I mean, since we've kind of started this discussion, I, the reason I asked is if it's a recommendation because I don't, I've, I've taken into consider, I've looked at a lot of things, particularly being in that, that conference. I am not necessarily in favor of transferring all of that over. I think that the fact that once it's there, it can't come back puts us at a, a limitation as to where we can go in the future. I do think something should be transferred over with the goal at over a period of time to get down to the six months to a year, like I would say a year, but I, at this point, don't think transferring it all over to get us to exactly a year is, um, I think it really 
ties our hands as a board and as a, the, the library itself um, with our operating expenses. I like Director Austin's suggestion of replenishing what we have spent this year. That's one tactic you can do in terms of what capital funds have been expended this year in terms of just replacing that. That's one option. That was what, 1.6? I forget. 1.8. Okay, 1.8 million. That's one tactic, but we could do the pros and cons of all at that meeting if you would like to discuss it. I'd yeah. say I, I agree with Fina that we um, plan on a finance committee meeting and ideally if the rest of the board, uh, the entire board could be, participate in that um, to take that to a, another meeting. Okay. Well, I, I think I'd feel a little more um, prepared for that rather than right at this moment. Okay. And we could send out a doodle poll for that. Okay. Are there, can I ask, are there any other comments about the levy itself as it stands just generally? Does anybody have any questions on the proposed, the proposed levy? I think we should talk about it at the finance committee. Okay. I just didn't know if there's anything we could clear up at this point before the finance committee. Okay. Okay. So we will leave that where we will schedule a finance committee meeting between now and the next uh, meeting with some further to discuss those different models. Is that you need for the for the levy, you need how many days to post it, Director Austin? Four days or a week? Um, it, well, we it, it needs to be submitted by the first Tuesday in December. So we need to take for, action. For the after. public, but for notice to the public that we're going to discuss it. Or do we? Um, it's part of our board packet materials. So the, the standard notice for, for our meetings. OK, thank you. OK, see you so board meeting to be is, is the 16th. So we have time before then. Mm -hmm. I just want to be clear um, to, to Lisa's statement a moment ago. Um, the if, um, if, if the library were to raise the levy, right? If we were to um, levy above CPI, if we were going for a referendum or a black box referendum, a scenario like that would require a levy hearing. Um, and that would require a different form of notices. Um, since we are, since at the Finance Committee on October 5th, we were unanimous as a seven member board that attended that meeting that we were moving forward with the proposal for a flat levy, which is what's in your packet tonight. Um, we would not need to hold a, um, a hearing. Um, the normal 48 hours notice for the board meeting would be substantial for providing that material in the packet. Just to be clear. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, do you want to give the capital repairs project update? Certainly. Dr. Austin, thank you. Thank you, yeah. So um, we are nearing completion of the project. As you see in the director's report, we are substantially complete. The overwhelming majority of our projects are in the final stages of their completion. Um, the remaining aspects of it at this point have been held up due primarily to um, the supply chain issues that seem to be affecting a number of things in, in the world right now. Um, so that's primarily the fire alarm project it has some equipment that um, chips and whatnot that are part of those um, uh, enunciators that, that we're still waiting for. But that's not news. I've been telling you that now for a couple meetings, I think. Um, so we're anticipating that equipment to arrive sometime in November and that we should see completion of that either by the end of November or early December. Um, the other aspect that is remaining to be completed is really just in the staff's hands at this point, and that is the implementation of the access control system. Um, access control is the key card system that we use to open various doors around the building. Um, we are in the process of coding all of those cards for each staff member and um, any of the contracted vendors and whatnot who are going to need those in order to have access to various spaces in the building. Once that system is um, completely programmed, we'll train the staff on it. We'll get in the habit of carrying these cards around. Um, and then we will replace all of the key sets on those doors um, so that it's just the access control that's on those, those doors going forward. Um, that's really the remaining aspect of the project. Um, there will be some closeout invoices that we'll see. The majority of the invoices that, that um, showed on our September financials 
really represents substantial completion of the project. There's a slight amount of retainer. Um, we are effectively un under budget and on time, um, save for that fire alarm project. But otherwise, um, we're, we're pretty much at the tail end of this. Um, we haven't seen a contractor in the building for a few days. Um, I believe it is tomorrow or Thursday. We're going to see um, some more of the carpentry work that's going to be done in the parking lot pickup room. We're replacing the counter and the sink in that space um, and preparing for the installation of the automated material handling system that will happen um, a little bit later in November. Um, but that's really the, the last bit of um, dusty work that's going to be done on the project. So we're, we're nearing the end. So hopefully at the November meeting, I can give you um, a closeout type of a, a summary report on, on what's happened with the project. Any, any questions about the construction project? Okay. Ready to do your director's report. Certainly. Let me get my report document here in front of me. So I'll kind of go through it um, briefly and, and highlight some of the points that I want to call out. Um, so my report generally begins with strategic plan summaries. And um, this month, I had a preface at the beginning of my report to explain what our strategic plan process is going to be um, in the course of the next year, or actually the next several months. Um, so we um, have a strategic plan that um, was initiated in 2018. And it was to end with, with um, this last fiscal year in uh, June 30th, 21. And we elected that we were going to continue with this current strategic plan set of goals through the balance of the current fiscal year. And that is why um, we've got a lot of the same goals that are showing up in these reports. Over the course of the next several months, we're going to be meeting um, as a board, as staff, and with focus groups with the community um, to help imagine Wilmet Library of the future. Um, we're going to start collecting more feedback. We're going to hold sessions. Um, we'll have broader discussions. We'll do environmental scanning. We'll look back at statistical uh, measures. We'll talk about our successes. We can talk about challenges. And mostly, we can talk about our aspirations um, and for what our vision is for the library going forward. I'm really excited to begin this process with you. As when I began here, I inherited the, 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 the current plan. And I'm happy to be able to work with the staff and you all, um, our newly elected board, to um, help bring this library forward and envision what the next several years are going to be for us. So we're going to get that project underway here very soon. Um, I know that Trustee McDonald has some ideas for how she wants to begin this process. And um, part of that is by having um, managers report to the board meeting, as we have over the, the course of the last couple of meetings. We'll resume that process here in the near future. And uh, you'll get more familiar with the managers, um, the trending that we're seeing in our individual departments, and what we're seeing around the industry at large, um, and what we think is going to be relevant in helping to serve our community in the future. So that's kind of where we're at as far as strategic planning goes. Um, any questions or, or further comments about um, where we're taking the strategic plan? Uh, just one quick question. One of the com one of the questions. Just wanted to throw it out to you is. I don't know if it would be better if we did a half day with different department heads coming in and saying it, tell, you know, doing basically an overview of their department, getting us familiar, as opposed to doing it once, you know, one showing up at every board meeting. And I, I would just love your take as to what you feel will be more beneficial in terms of just getting to know the different departments and also just engaging the staff as to what they see open for discussion right now just briefly what you what your preference is it would be either coming one department to each board meeting or just spending a half day and just having them come through and then maybe you know and just sort of brainstorming with them and it's open to the public but i think it'd be a more uh more you know where they actually do a presentation and a prepared presentation and it's along similar reins for each of those departments so you know what they are. And we might go to the departments or not, whether it's in person or not, and just get a view of a day in their life, 10 minutes in their life, as opposed to a day in their life, because we're not gonna spend a day in their life. But your thoughts? 
I, I like it. I, and I think we could do a yes and. I, I think yeah. we, could certain, we could certainly still have managers visit us and give us reports on various projects that they're working on, um, trends that they're seeing, as well as holding uh, a workshop where um, everyone has a chance to contribute. And you would have the benefit of hearing all those updates in one fell swoop. Um, so yeah, I, th I think we could we could do either or both. What's your pleasure? I'm, I'm just wondering in terms of your commitment as uh, the board, in terms of availability for a half day. That's the first question out there. You're throwing that out to the whole board? Are you asking us? Yes, yes uh, I'm like asking you because you all have to attend. I like that idea. I like, I like that idea. Okay. You too. I do too. And, and I think there was some talk um, about, well, I'll just throw this out, actually almost like a field trip because seeing what other libraries are doing, specifically Skokie, and um, as I have just visited once, but to me it seems like um, the library of the future. And it might be interesting too if we could meet with any of their staff um, briefly, I, I wouldn't want to impose on them, but, um, I think that would be informative too. Skokie's a much larger library. So I think in addition to Skokie, it'd be good to look at one that's similar size and demographics True. to what we're yeah. doing also, so that you can compare the both. And then the other uh, question, and we, uh, Joan and I had talked about it as well as Trish, is we had talked about having uh, trustees be present maybe you know two hours a month and alternating and just sitting there and being present to talk to uh, our public. And then one of the things, uh, citizens, our constituents, and one of the things Director Austin was going to do was get what the busiest times are and then sign up for maybe two hour shifts and just sort of throw it out. But at that time, I thought it would be a good way besides just saying hello. And I think we talked about it in terms of you all just asking three questions, you know, just hello, introduce yourself, just say what departments are you using? What do you like about it? What would you like to see improved? If your vision in the library of the future, what might it look like? And then saying if we, when we get further down with our strategic plan, would you be willing to participate in a discussion and gather their names? And then we would do that on a Apple thing. But I think if it's focused and then it can go wherever you want it to go, that discussion. But I thought that might be an interesting way to engage and see what their thoughts are. And one of the things that Director Austin said is to capture that on a tablet and we could all learn how to do it. And just when they do that. So that would be a way to just sort of do some be engaged in it. And then later with the public, Lisa, is this with yeah. the public or with the staff? I, oh, getting, no, no, I'm no. With the, public, we, with the public, we would yeah. just be there. We'd be open because I know one of the things be at the library in, at the library. in the vestibule, okay. correct? In the, in the vestibule yeah. or you yeah. end up in the kids department may try a bunch of different departments that have high volume. You get a lot. In I, I think it's like mini focus groups on it. Many IDIs, not focus group, because you're only talking okay. to one person. So that's that's not going okay. My terminology. But it's just inter but like internal. It. But like within three to five minutes, just sort of capturing it. Because you can say hello, my name is Trustee, but beyond that, what are you gonna say? So I'm just trying to get more information to gather it. And you may have other ideas. And then I think Trustee O'Keefe threw out an idea which falls into Trustee Nealon's uh community connections, basically, uh, that we, and you can talk about it, Trustee O'Keefe. And then I think Trust Director Austin expanded it a little bit more in a conversation. So I thought it, it would be interesting to have like a morning coffee the same weekend or the same Saturday every year um, when new trustees come in and trustees leave kind of as a a welcome and a thank you. And we have basically like a morning coffee and we're present. And on years that we don't have, you know, members coming on or uh, leaving, we just, we consistently have this once a year and we build it into our schedule. And then Director Austin expanded it a little bit more as to what his older other library did that he was at. You wanna talk about that, Anthony? Sure. So, I mean, the concept was coffee and conversation. So we would look at what are some of the busy hours at the library in terms of our door count, 
and then have you stationed at a table in the vestibule where you would have cookies and coffee or something to lure people to the table to basically say, meet your trustees. Um, hi, we're, we're your elected officials. We serve the library board and we're here to listen to you. What's your feedback about the library? What's your vision? Let's collect some of your feedback. Um, you can leave a comment here or I can collect it and we can put it on this, this iPad or, or whatever, um, but a great way to engage. Um, it's a model that we're actually going to be doing with some of our state and federal representatives. Um, you may have seen that that um, office hours at some agencies where you know some of our senators and representatives will um, have stations at public libraries or other public facilities where they will engage with their constituents. And that's in fact kind of what I think this model is. And we're going to be doing that very soon. Um, I think Senator Fine's office was kind of co um, coordinating this and then other um, elected officials are gonna be taking advantage of that. So um, I think our community is going to get familiar with the notion that elected officials can be met um, at the library in the vestibule. And if we're doing it for that level of office, I think we probably could do it for our level of office as well. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a structured time. It could be at your, at your mutual convenience um, and looking at statistical measures, if that's a factor for you all. Um, we may want to change it out. Maybe one day it's, or one, one month it's on a Saturday, another month it's on a, you know, Tuesday evening or, or what have you. Um, that way we can capture different audiences at different times. So just that's kind of the concept behind it, but definitely building upon what, what uh, Trustee O'Keefe was saying. Yes. And, and I think you can also add, oh, I'm sorry, Lisa. Um, I think you could also add, you know, if we have something like this, like this annual coffee or monthly coffee tied in with the friends having a pop-up sale, if that, you know, is on their schedule. So, you know, we're showing all the different facets of the library from, you know, our staff and our admin and our patrons and our trustees and friends of the library and kind of continue to create those connections. And some of us would like to try it in November just to see how it works and we'll report back to you. Okay. Director Austin, you wanna continue? All right, I'll, I'll get in. I'm sorry, one quick thing is I, I, I know when we did the last strategic plan, one of the things we did talk about was what ways can we better have two-way communication between patrons, the community, and the library, and I think this is a this is a great uh, addition to that to that thought. So, excellent. All right. Well, looking forward to to seeing more of that um, community engagement. That's awesome. Um, on a similar note, that'll that'll be my bridge. Um, we did do some community engagement um, with our partner community Kenilworth um, early this month. Um, Kenilworth was celebrating its 125th anniversary of incorporation. And um, they celebrated with a block party outside of um, uh, Kenilworth Assembly Hall. And they had a wonderful gathering on Sunday, October 10th. And um, circulation manager uh, Kim Hegland and I were at that event along with our partner agency, Winnetka Northfield Library. We both had tables there. And um, we were trying to lure um, Kenilworth residents who didn't have library cards to register at one of our tables. Um, and um, it was wonderful. We had, a, we had a really great experience. It was a positive opportunity for us to engage with our Kenilworth trustees. They too are working on a, a community engagement plan, um, kind of like we are through our community connection committee. And um, I think it was a it was a great success. We we registered a, a good number of patrons. I'm sorry, I don't have the number off the top of my head, um, but we registered a number of patrons for new cards. Um, we met with some of our existing Kenilworth residents who use our facilities and. Um, um, wanted to provide us with feedback. We brought books that folks could check out. We checked out some items. Um, all in all, it was a great way to promote our services and. Um, uh, we're looking to do more events like that in the future. So I was happy to, to share that news with you all um, in terms of community engagement. Um, in terms of meeting the, the community, we do have, as I mentioned, when you first come in the library, um, we have a new welcome desk. This has been out for a while now, and um, I added a section of my report here to talk a little bit more about the welcome desk, as it is one of the first spaces that you come to when you come in the library. Um, I wanted to note that um, our door counts for September 
um, were our second highest um, since the pandemic began. Um, we had over 13,000 visitors in the building in September. Um, now it used to be in the 30s, so that's still not quite where I'd love it to be. Um, but I've got another number I'll share with you in a little bit that, that maybe will surprise you. Um, but 13,000 is pretty great for us after the 16,000 high that we had in July. So, and right in the middle of summer reading, it was obviously high traffic, but with the kids back in school and everything, we were really impressed with what we saw in September as this signals that things are starting to get back to whatever normal is going to be. Um, patrons have really been enjoying this new welcome desk. Um, statistically, we've noted that um, we had direct patron contact with 3,000 um, of our patrons at this welcome desk in September. And based upon our door counts, that would be one in four patrons um, stopped at the welcome desk. So it's a great opportunity for us to engage. Uh, the welcome desk is in fact where our switchboard is located now. So when you call the library uh, to our general line, it goes to that location and then we'll route your calls or address your questions at that location. So it's kind of the hub um, from which um, we're operating um, a lot of our greeting for the, for the library. So that is what the welcome desk is. And um, Happy to welcome aboard our, our full-time welcome desk assistant, Colleen Reese, in her new role. She's been working in circulation with us for a long time, and we're thrilled to have her in her new capacity there. Um, moving on to my report, getting into the collections. Um, I did want to note, as I mentioned earlier, that um, we are looking at some trending that we're seeing uh, that supply chain issues are starting to hit the publishing industry. Um, we've noticed that some of the, the, the titles, the big titles that we were anticipating seeing getting launched this fall and winter um, are being held up in production. Um, so that means if there are labor shortages and paper mills can't produce what they need to produce and that there's distribution issues with logistics and shipping, um, it so follows that we may not get the materials that we ordered in the fashion that we expected them to. Um, and that will have other sweeping impacts. I mean, not just, you know, well, I'm not going to get my hold material. Well, you're not going to get your hold because the item isn't available. But that also means that maybe we can't do that book as a book discussion, or um, it may affect some programming plans that we had for, for some of the titles and, and things that are associated. So, you know, it's kind of the, the butterfly in the, in the forest right now, but it's certainly, um, we're seeing a lot of imp impacts um, as far as supply side goes, and I'll get into that here again in a moment, but um, that, is, that is a trend that we're noticing. Um, so obviously the big supply chain issue that we've noted is that our automated material handling system has definitely been held up, um, not only missing the boat on its first go around, um, it's just that there are other logistical issues apparently that, that affect the, the transport of these systems. It is in motion. It's destined for, for the United States. I guess it's, it's in the ocean right now, maybe. Um, so it is on its way. And uh, once it arrives here, um, it will then be uh, carted off to the library sometime in late November at this point is what we're anticipating. So unfortunately, I think at the next meeting on the 16th, I won't be able to give you the news that it has been installed, but hopefully, um, you know, before December is out, uh, that new system will be up and running and um, you'll be the first to know as soon as we've got that up and running. Um, any questions about the automated material handling system? I know we've talked about that a lot here, but I just want to make sure if there's any lingering questions that we address it. Um, I guess I will add that we have a new rep with Biblioteca who met with us in person last week. And um, she's relatively new to the company. Um, she wanted to hear what our concerns were and is very much motivated towards making us a satisfied customer. She understands that there were a number of challenges with the implementation of our system this year. A lot of things that were outside of the library's hands. Um, and uh, she's definitely motivated towards getting the right result for us. So I felt encouraged. Um, the staff who were in that meeting with me were as well. Um, so it's good to have direct contact with someone in our region that's going to be serving us directly. So um, I do think that there, there is some positive light at the end of this tunnel. Um, so from the technical, technical services side for our statistics, I did want to note that um, we have one of our busiest months of the year in terms of our stats in uh, TS. Um, so in terms of acquisition, we acquired over 3,500 items for our collection just in this last month. Um, and if you look at the statistics on page five of my report, you can see that that is a marked um, improvement over where we've been um, in the past. So we're starting to see an influx of materials that we had ordered. 
Um, I don't know if the trending is related to any supply chain issues and, and why there was a big dump of those items just in one month. But I can tell you that the staff in technical services has been working really hard to get those items um, received, processed, cataloged, and back out onto the shelves for the public to enjoy. Um, speaking of the um, RFID project, I wanted to mention that we did do a little bit of movement of our self-checkout stations. If you've been in the library lately, you will have noticed that the larger self-check 1000 units, those are the ones that have the um, portrait oriented monitor on them uh, that have all the fancy lights on them. Uh, those three units that are on the uh, second, first and lower level have been relocated to somewhat more central locations, their intended locations when we initially purchased them. Uh, the low voltage contractor that did a lot of rewiring for us as part of our uh, construction project was able to install some additional lines of data, data cable for us, which enabled us to place them where we had intended. So um, two of them on the first and second level are located next to elevator B on the east side of the library. And um, the one on the lower level is right by the stairs um, as you go down from the large print area down to the nonfiction collection. Um, so we're excited about that. Um, in circulation, we welcomed 350 new Wilmette resident cards in September. Um, National Library Card Sign Up Month is September, and we did a fab job um, uh, registering a good number of, uh, of new card holders, including 172 um, children in District 39. So our partnership with D39 is certainly um, has been very fruitful in, in terms of um, driving that traffic to us. So we're really grateful for that. So this is the statistic now that I really wanted to share from the circulation report. So we're really encouraged by the door counts, but I am actually very encouraged by the circulation numbers. Um, the total circulation for September was 64,184 items. And in September of 2020, we circulated 55,000. 261, so we were up 16% from 2020. And in 2019, we circulated 59,292, which means that this year, we were up 8% over our pre-pandemic numbers. So even though the door count was about half of what it has been historically, our circulation is up. And I'm really encouraged by that. I think I think the staff is doing a great job. I think the public is engaged and is certainly taking advantage of our collections. Um, I think this is a positive signal and a few of these things are certainly um, cumulatively are gonna mark that we're, we're making a trend towards, uh, towards the better, that we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a library in recovery right now. So I'm very much encouraged by those figures. Um, Kim has provided some statistical charts in, in the report here for you. Uh, to go over. Um, if you've got any comments about those, or if there are some sorts of uh, charts or measures that you would like to see, um, we certainly love to represent our data. Let us know if there's, an, if there's anything that we can provide for you there. Um, moving Anthony, forward. Sir, Anthony, one question. I was yeah. trying to figure out from, the, from all the graphs and statistics here, um, with, the, with the healthy surge in, in circulation, um, is that all coming from, or mostly coming from online um, or is it, is, are people checking out more items at a time when they're showing up the library, so that if you have that statistic? Yeah, so I mean, I can comment on that. I mean, um, we processed nearly 8,500 holds last month. So that certainly accounts for, um, you know, about an eighth of the circulation that we had um, was coming from other libraries um, in terms of our holds. Uh, but the overwhelming majority of our circulation is right here inside the library. Um, digital circulation um, is not part of the, of the, well, yeah, that is part of the, the um, that material. So digital circulation still is up um, from where it's been. But I don't think that that's the tipping point. I still think it, it, it represents a, a small portion of our physical material circulation. Thank you. Um, all right, moving forward, um, I would note that we did resume in-person programming inside the library for the first time since the pandemic began uh, in September. So um, we, uh, we had our first indoor program. So I just, I just wanna mention that. I think that the statistics for those programs, not as great as I think what we have seen in the past, but I think we also recognize that there are a number of factors out there for folks 
um, and whether they're feeling comfortable enough to bring their families back in for in-person programming. So we continue to offer um, hybrid options, either um, exclusively digital programming uh, virtually or some on-site programming outside at a social distance. Uh, and we'll continue to do that as long as there's weather for it. Um, we did have story times this morning, so it was a lovely day today, but we'll see how long we can sustain that. Um, to that end, um, we've got a, a newsletter that's coming out for uh, November, December. That should be hitting your mailboxes here in about a week. Uh, and you'll see a whole raft of really awesome programming that we've got teed up for the end of the year to bring us forward. Um, just trying to sail through some of the highlights of our report. Obviously, speaking of communications, our biggest news of the month was the launch of our new website. Um, a lot of detail associated with the website. It is obviously a work in progress. Um, there are still some challenges that we're trying to put out um, at this moment. Um, today, one of our challenges was it appears that there's some spam that's hitting our contact us uh, button on the website. So um, we've got a CAPTCHA on there, but for some reason we're still getting some stuff that's coming through there that we're not anticipating. We're also having a difficulty with rendering some of the data, particularly on the board page. Um, I don't like the way that the board materials are displaying when I post the packet. I think I'm gonna find a different way to do this. Um, I don't believe that that methodology is gonna work for us going forward. Um, as far as that table and the naming convention goes for the content management, it's, it leaves a little bit to be desired. So I'm gonna go back to the developer. We've certainly got them on retainer uh, to, to fix some of the issues that we're still addressing. So. It is a work in progress. Um, it, it's functional in a lot of ways. It's a huge improvement over our previous site. Um, we're right now kind of in the, um, in the fix it mode of, of addressing some of the, the lingering issues that um, have snared us um, upon launch. But overall, not I don't mean to, to steal the thunder of what's great about the website. We're really thrilled about it so far. We've got great response from the public about it. Um, we're getting a lot of traction on our book rivers and some of the specific pages that we've posted um, for business and genealogy have definitely drawn a lot of attention. Um, our electronic resources is another area that we're looking to try to enhance access to those. I did share some information with you all via email uh, before this meeting about that. Um, stay tuned for more information about our research regarding proxy servers. I'll give you more detail here soon about that, but I think that will definitely enhance access to the digital resources, particularly some of those subscription databases um, that Trustee Summer had mentioned um, in the report regarding our ProQuest platforms and so on. Um, we did update the graphics on our catalog page as well as our events calendar so that they match our platform and everything looks seamless. Um, so yeah, um, I, I'll pause there for a moment. Any any comments, questions, or feedback regarding the website that you all want to address here this evening? Uh, I guess one question about the proxy servers: where um, where would they go? Like, do they stay in the physical building, or can they go somewhere beyond the building to to add access for uh, patrons? Yeah. So, in a nutshell, a proxy server is an authentication tool. Uh, that lives virtually. It's not a physical device. It's a subscription that we would coordinate with a third party that would effectively treat um, databases that patrons historically would need to access inside the library. So there are a number of like business databases um, that vendors um, require that patrons access while they're on our premises. Um, there are some that allow us to work through a proxy which means that a patron, um, patron's device at home would pass through a gateway that would effectively act as though the patron was sitting at the library and they would be able to have remote access to that material at home. Um, certainly as part of our strategic plan to enhance access to our materials and we invest a fair amount in our digital resources, it would be great if we could offer a service like this. Um, so there are opportunities for us to do this. There are models that we, that we can follow from a lot of academic libraries. We've got partners at CCS that know how proxy servers work and can kind of help us guide through this process. It is a new process for us. And um, with the implementation of such a system, there's a lot of maintenance that's involved in it because the linking changes on a regular basis in order to keep it secure. So it isn't just as simple as you light this thing up, it turns on and it's great. There's a lot of maintenance that goes into it. And we currently don't have a staffing model that can support that. 
However, we can build upon that. And when we're up to capacity, I think this is something we can very easily accommodate in our budget. And with the appropriate staffing, I think it's a great service enhancement that we'll be able to launch here, hopefully in the next couple months. Is there an added expense from the content provider if we have like a volume of people that are coming through the proxy versus going through the, the library itself? Or? Nope, it doesn't have that impact. Thank okay. You. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, anything else about the website? Okay. It's very user friendly, Anthony. I'm really enjoying it. I know you received that feedback. It's it's a, it's a, you know, it's a big improvement. I, I didn't feel like I needed that improvement. I didn't realize how much more interactive it could be. And, and, you know, even for the kids, it's, it's easy for my kids to even follow along and go to the YouTube videos. They're watching some of the, the views for the, you know, the story time. So um, it's great. So please pass that along. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess the, the last thing I wanted to add is um, the library was featured in kind of an oblique manner through a very wonderful article that was posted on the North Shore Record um, earlier this month. There was a, a wonderful article that was celebrating the Friends of the Library, um, capturing um, their anniversary, um, as well as recognizing that Books Down Under, our bookstore in the lower level of the library is now officially reopened. And the friends are going to be hosting an outdoor book sale uh, this weekend um, on the 23rd. Um, and I encourage you to check out their website, which is on our website, to learn more about um, the friends' governance and about their plans, to see the hours for the bookstore. Um, and a copy of that article is, in, um, is appended to my report as well. Um, I'll take any questions that you may have for anything else that's in my report or any other library-related items that you'd like to discuss. Uh, Joan. Um, I'm delighted about the welcome desk. And um, I think it's situated in a, in a good spot, but I haven't noticed any signage, but maybe it's been a week or so that I haven't walked by. Is there signage that identifies why that person's sitting there and um, how, what, the, what it can be, how it can help patrons coming in? Certainly. Um, if you look at the picture on page two of my report, you'll see that there that there's a sign on the front of the desk that says welcome desk. Oh, okay. Um, so there's I that. But I will add that this is a temporary piece of furniture. We have ordered That's an right. actual Good official call. desk that we're going to be launching here as soon as that becomes available. Supply chain issues notwithstanding. Um, oh, oh, okay. That's what related. I, I um, that desk that we're purchasing um, is coming from LFI, Library Furniture International. They were responsible for the, the furnishings on the second floor of the library when we updated the Youth Services Department. They're going to be providing us with that furniture. They're also going to be here on Thursday and install the shelving on the lower level right outside of BDU, where we're going to house our oversized collection. I've been talking about that for a couple months, and that's finally coming to fruition. So by the end of this week, we will have our oversized collection unified with the nonfiction books on the lower level. And that will effectively mean that all the circulating materials will be off of the mezzanine level of the library and much more accessible down with the rest of the collection on the lower level. Not to take it off of your subject there, Joan, but yes, we are working to improve the welcome desk. Good. Any other questions or comments? If not, then I will turn it back to President McDonald. Thank you, Director Austin, for all the work you and your staff do. And I hope the employment cycle, personnel cycle, you market increases. That's about it in terms of new hires so that you can fill some of those positions. We're going to turn it over to committee reports. And two of our trustees went to the uh, ILA conference. Trustee Summer has already talked briefly about it. Trustee Fishman, did you go? I went. And oh, Trustee Nealon went. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And and you want to talk briefly about the highlights? For well, you? sure. Um, there was a special block of, of recommended sessions for trustees. 
Um, and in addition to the property tax levy um, presentation that um, Trustee Summer uh, cited, there was uh, a trustee, uh, there was a sessions on community engagement and advocacy uh, using, uh, uh, I think Highwood, Highwood Library was a model for how they uh, connected with their primarily Spanish speaking uh, patrons. And uh, it was it was really quite interesting. And then um, other than that, I think, um, oh yeah, there were, there were sessions on the trustee role versus staff and the relationship and on working with legislature, legislators, state legislators and um, uh, to promote uh, library uh, awareness and goals. So uh, I, I, it, was a, it was a good program. Good. Trustee Summer, do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, yeah, I thought the, the one, um, Trish, the, the one that had Highwood, uh, the Highwood Library was really fascinating. I thought it was a very interesting um, presentation about really evaluating the needs of the community and working the the staff working for example language was an issue they didn't have any spanish speaking or very limited number of spanish speaking uh employees of the library and they've really worked to ensure that they have people speaking multiple languages that represent those in the community so i thought that was really good the other thing i thought was really interesting was the role of trustees and you're just seeing what's perhaps going on in some of the other libraries in our community, which I can think of one in particular, um, ensuring that we follow our role as trustees. We are not the director of the library. We do not hire people. We don't pick the books. Our job of trustee is, is very different. We have a different role. And it was very, very good. It was informative. Thank you both. Director Austin, um, do you want to- oh, I wanted to say there, they are, um, there are going to be recordings. And I don't know, um, Tracy, maybe you know if, everyone could maybe access um, some of the recordings or, or if only you and I can um, for some of the sessions that we miss. So if anybody wants to like attend the uh, property tax levy um, session remotely, um, I'll find out about that, whether everybody can access them and let everybody know. Yeah, I, I don't know if everybody can. I don't know if you had to be registered to be able to get, uh, get the recorded sessions. I don't know. Right, I'll find out. Thank you. Director Austin, you were going to do a Rails update. Anything new with Rails? Um, not a lot of substantive information to share from Rails. I will say that um, they did post an update to the Realm study. You may recall that early in the pandemic, um, I referred to the Realm study an awful lot. That is um, an association that represents libraries and museums. Um, and we were studying a lot of um, scientific data about how uh, the pandemic may be affecting our materials and, and other library related matters. Um, there is, there's actually been a, a, a lot of continuing longitudinal studies and that information continues to be posted and updated on the Rails coronavirus page, which is linked on, on the agenda. Um, and there's some interesting, um, some webinars that have been posted from those who are convening the Realm study. So if that is a topic that is of interest to you and you're interested in the long tail of COVID and how that's going to affect our services going forward, I think there's some interesting data to, to be had there. Um, the other item that I would share regarding Rails, at least at this point, is that um, um, we, uh, Wilmette Library is now participating in the Explore More Illinois program which is an expansion of our current museum pass program. You may, you may have used the museum adventure pass to um, come to the library and check out a pass that would grant you access to a museum either at a discount or for free. Um, this is a second program now that expands the number of, of museums that we offer these passes to. This one does not require you to come into the library to acquire a pass. You just go to the Explore More Illinois website, um, see the list of participating, uh, museums, enter your library card information, and you can print your pass right there from home. Uh, so um, if you go to the menu on, on the library's website, um, and uh, I, mean, I just want to make sure I can tell you exactly where to find this, it is under books and media. And if you click on museum passes, you'll get to a landing page that we just added, and it will tell you a little bit more about uh, the services that are offered in that program. And that is offered in partnership with Rails. Um, and that is all I have for my Rails report. Thank you. Uh, you've got information items now and we're transitioning. Uh, 
Director Austin sent you the three uh, comments and from the suggestion box, and he has been he has responded to all three of them, and they some of them are still works in process, as he explained regarding the proxy. Uh, I point, appointed Trustee Nealon and Wolf to represent WPLD on the Village Wide Intergovernmental Co Operation Committee because uh, Trustee Nealon chairs the Community Connections. And I also appointed Trustee Wolf to serve on that committee. And what they're going to be doing is basically they will be having their initial meeting. And uh, in terms of talking to the village president, one of the things that she suggested is at that point in time, they're going to decide on what common issue they want to uh, address. And I know one of the things that she talked about was the sustainability, since the villages did their sustainability uh, report and how that might, how the other entities, intergovernmental entities might work with that. Another one that they talked about was uh, mental health. And so at that meeting, they, uh, the participants and representatives will decide how they work, what they do. And so it's just pretty much in developmental stages. So that's just a look at what that's going to be. Uh, the League of Women Voters will have their biennial State of the Village event. It'll be held on Wednesday, November 10th at 7 p.m. at the Mallinckrodt Community Center. They will, it will only be open to 60, it'll be capped at 60 to 75 people due to COVID. They will be sending out notices next week to all the different government trustees, as well as noting it in their newsletter. Can I make a comment on that, Lisa? Yes. Uh, it will be capped at 80 people. Actually, I was in the meeting this morning and oh. you will need to either show a vaccination card or a negative COVID test to attend. Okay, thank you. Thanks okay. for updating it. That that uh, Wendy had sent me that this morning. So thank you You're welcome. for clarifying that. Uh, I basically am on the sesquicentennial committee representing the library, which is the 150th anniversary and how the library will be interacting. And I'll be working with Anthony and his staff but basically, we're going to probably try to tie in to some of the existing programs and it will be synergistic in terms of utilizing what we already have. And so more information to come because we didn't plan to start anything in January, even though they wanted to start it. They're starting it, I think, really at the Beach Bash is where they sort of announced it with programs evolving. And there is one website that you can go to see what some of the existing programs are, and it's wilmet150.org. And they've got a lot of things planned. So more, I will have more information next month. Thank you. And then uh, meet the author. Do you want to talk a little bit about that just briefly? Anthony? Sure. Um, we've got a, actually a number of author events that are happening this fall. And um, all three of them are going to be noted in uh, the newsletter that's going to be hitting your home next week. So definitely look for the page about Meet the Author, but the actual official Meet the Author program that is funded by the Friends of the Library um, will be held on Wednesday, December 1 at 7 p.m. via Zoom with Omar el Akkad, the author of What Strange Paradise, and that book is available now and is circulating like hotcakes here. Um, if you're interested, um, you can pre-register for the event at the link on the agenda there. Um, information also available on our website. Okay, that concludes our informational item. Is there any new business? Going once, going twice. I move that the board adjourn this meeting at 8.14. I'll second. Second, and I'll second. We'll second it and we can have a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? This concludes our meeting. Thank you and have a good week. Thank you.